This is the Pixar Sciatica Podcast. Updated guide to fixing your sciatica. Now, this episode is an updated version from one of the first episodes I actually recorded for this podcast. And certainly, I've learned a lot over the past three years. So let's get right into it. How can you fix your own sciatica? In today's episode, we're going to talk about specifically what is sciatica? And then number two, how do we treat it? It's pretty simple. The great news is that this treatment approach can be applied to not just sciatica pain, but if you're dealing with stuff like knee pain, carpal tunnel pain, hip pain, low back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, this treatment structure can also help you self-treat those issues as well. So what is sciatica? If you are listening to this episode and been a regular listener, you have probably heard multiple times that sciatica is irritation of the sciatic nerve. And what is it itself? The sciatic nerve is the thickest and longest nerve in the body and expands from the nerve roots or spinal levels of L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3. And it covers sensation and motor control of the area of the low back, the hamstring, and everything below the knee. That includes the front and the backside. But what about our butt? A lot of times you'll see when you type in sciatica pain, they're going to say pain that radiates into your back, into your butt, and then go down, goes down your leg. Unfortunately, irritation of the butt or butt pain is actually going to be caused by irritation of a different set of nerves. The butt area is actually covered by the superior and inferior gluteal nerves. And if you're dealing with buttock pain, your sciatic nerve is actually not involved unless the pain starts to radiate down your leg. So it could be a combination of nerves. Another question is, well, what about the front of your thigh, aka your thigh, uh, AKA, aka your quad? The front of your thigh includes your quadriceps, and this muscle area is covered actually by your femoral nerve, and that nerve also splits into the saphenous nerve, which actually runs on the inner edge of your calf. And so, if you have that inner edge, inner calf pain with anterior thigh pain or quad pain, we're probably dealing with more irritation of the femoral nerve, and that what that means is that if we're looking at pure sciatic nerve irritation, we're actually looking specifically at hamstring pain, outer knee, and lateral cap into the whole foot. Now, although your sciatic nerve, your gluteal nerve, and femoral nerve are actually different nerves in general, they have and, and they also have different pathways, the management is actually still pretty similar between the three different nerves. And the way that we're going to be able to do it is actually starting off the low back and then working our way down. And then because these nerves are so long, they will actually have many areas in which they can be irritated. Often it's going to be the low back and mostly it's going to be the hip. So we're going to be spending the majority of today's time specifically on those two areas. And so let's get into some actual self-treatment, right? How do we fix this problem? Now, rather than having you go through the top 10 exercises to fix sciatica pain, which often include stretches that will contradict each other like a back bend, a forward bend, child's pose, and then a cobra, you don't have to guess. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to walk you through the exact process as to how I work with my clients and patients to help them fix their sciatic pain. And if you don't have a pen and paper right now, pause this episode and grab it so you can take some notes during today's talk. And let's start from the beginning. Let's go back to when you started to feel this pain. Was it a sudden onset of pain, like you were deadlifting and you heard a pop and then felt pain? Or was it a more gradual onset? If it was a sudden onset of pain with a specific activity, what this actually tells us is that we need to actually evaluate that specific activity and identify what is going on, what happened. Usually when you felt pain, when you pick something up from the ground, it's most likely that you were either too arched too rounded or too twisted. And this is going to serve as useful information later on in this episode. Now, on the other hand, if your pain actually came on gradually, as in you weren't really quite sure as to when or how, you just realized that you were in fact pain and wasn't going away, we actually need to make note of the activities that were done prior to the onset of pain. You're gonna try your best, right? Look into how you're sitting, how you're standing, how you're doing things as well. Again, we're gonna be looking at how things are done versus what things are done, which obviously is an important concept. But from there, once we were able to get the history, right? We need to actually rule out any red flags. And what is a medical red flag? It's something that tells us that 
exercise, stretching, or movement isn't going to really serve that much of a purpose because there's something else happening uh, underlying that we need to get addressed first. So ask yourself these questions. Since the onset of your pain, have you experienced nausea or vomiting? General malaise or not feeling well? Fever, sweats, or chills? Saddle anesthesia, which is actually numbness in your pelvic region? unexplained weakness or any changes in your bowel or bladder function. Now, if you answer yes to any one of these questions, discuss it with your doctor before proceeding with the rest of this episode. Now it's time to establish a baseline. We need to make note of what you're experiencing at this time, how you are feeling. It's not just, I feel bad. It's not just, I feel pain. We need to know where is your pain? How big is it? Where would you describe it? Is it more diffuse? Is it more localized? We have to mark specifically where you're dealing and experiencing that pain. We also need to identify what is the intensity on a scale of zero to 10 with 10 being like, chop my leg off. This is the worst thing ever as a 10 out of 10 and zero being no pain at all, which if you had no pain, you wouldn't be listening to this episode. And then the third question is, how would you describe that pain? The more you can describe it, the more you can actually identify, are there changes that are actually happening? And from there, we have to identify not only what are you experiencing, but how are you experiencing it? Are you experiencing the pain at rest? In which positions are you experiencing pain? Is the pain happening in standing, sitting, walking, or lifting? You have to make a note of all of these activities because it's important for us to get this information. I want you to consider every piece of information like a breadcrumb that we are trying to follow for the big piece, which is going to allow us to solve the problem. And when you're dealing with pain at rest, it means that you are in an active state of pain, either in the position itself. Um, we have to look at how you're doing the activities and we should be focusing on pain relief. Now, why is it so important for us to actually settle a baseline, set a baseline? What are you experiencing now? Because it allows us to determine if what we're doing is actually helpful. So before you do any other stretch or exercise, you have to take a mental note of your baseline, do the activity, and then reassess its effectiveness before you actually repeat or move on. And this is going to save you a lot of time and energy trying to do countless exercises designed to improve your sciatica. And one of the most important points throughout this whole episode is that if you are in an active state of pain, aka if you're listening and you're dealing with pain right now, your focus should be doing everything you can to reduce that pain, either get rid of that pain completely, which I would hope that we do. Um, but if it's just a slight reduction in your pain, that's also good information as well, which brings up how can we tell if we're actually getting better, right? So here are the criteria in regards to knowing that we are making improvements. Number one is going to be the intensity. The intensity of your pain gets closer to a zero. The pain area actually reduces in size or becomes a little bit more localized. Another sign that your pain is improving is through what we call centralization. And what that means is when the symptoms or your pain starts to travel up closer to the source. So if you say you have more diffuse hamstring and calf pain and you do a stretch and all of a sudden you just have hamstring pain, that is a good progression. If, for example, you're doing these exercises and now your leg pain is gone, but your back is killing you, although that is still really painful, we are heading in the right direction. Things are becoming more centralized. And then uh, last but not least, I think it's important when it comes to the description of our symptoms, I want you to imagine a spectrum. If we're looking at one end of the spectrum, there's going to be the most amount of nerve irritation. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's going to be no nerve irritation at all. We're looking at on the most irritated is going to be complete numbness. There's no sensation. You know you're touching it, but you can't feel it. That is going to be significant nerve irritation. We then, as things start to heal up a little bit more, you might feel more of a burning, kind of like a pins and needles sensation where that muscle is kind of falling asleep or that area is kind of falling asleep. And then as we start to get a little bit better, it might turn into more of like a burning sensation. And then from burning, we transition to more of a sharp shooting nervy type of pain. And then as things start to improve a little bit more, we go from nervy down to more of a deep ache. 
And then from that deep ache, we can transition into more of like a heaviness type of scenario. Some people kind of alluded saying like, it's akin to like wearing a sock for a long period of time and you're finally taking off and feeling that heaviness. And then the last piece is obviously symptom resolution, no nerve irritation at all. So it is important to make note of that progress. So then that way you can know, are you making forward progress or are you regressing? The exact opposite is true if you know that you're getting worse. So if things are getting more intense or the air is starting to get a little bit bigger, or the pain starts to travel down your leg a little bit farther than what it was like before we call that peripheralization. Those are signs that what we're doing is actually irritating your nerve a little bit more. And we would need to make some specific changes. This episode is brought to you by the Patient Advocate Program. Are you tired of not having support between your rehab sessions? Introducing the Patient Advocate Program, and we're focused on your recovery and we're offering you 24-7 access to a doctorate of physical therapy. Stop waiting in line to be seen and stop spending hours doing long exercise programs. Imagine being able to get all of your care delivered straight to your phone. Best of all, it's affordable. We believe everyone deserves top-notch relief without breaking the bank. So why wait? Take control of your health today and visit PT Patient advocate.com and book your free call with our experts. The next step is to actually assess your posture. When looking at yourself in the mirror from the side, there should be a nice gentle S curve of your back, which means that the knee should be in a straight line. They're not bent, but they're not hyperextended either. Your hip bones should actually be pointing straight ahead and your rib cage should be stacked right on top of your hips and they aren't flaring out. You'll notice because you can see your ribs and your shirt. And if you notice any of this changes, see how you feel. Just make some small corrections. If your ribs are flared, see what it's like to draw the rib cage down. If you feel like everything's tilting forward, see what it's like to draw your pubic bone up to your rib cage and see if there's any sort of changes from that angle. The next is to look at yourself in the mirror straight on. Are your shoulders shifted to one side? Sometimes people will actually confuse shoulder one shoulder higher than the other as a shift but that's just a normal asymmetry. If you're right-handed, usually your right shoulder is lower than your left and vice versa. But we are in fact looking if your shoulders are shifted over to one side, what that means is are your shoulders leaning and is there more space between your arms and your body? If that's the case, if you notice that you are shifted to one direction, try to lean in the opposite direction to get your shoulders to sit right on top of your hips. We call this a shift correction and you can do this before anything else. And you might even notice an improvement in how you feel when you make this change. If at any point you notice that your symptoms do come back after not doing a shift for a while, take a look at yourself in the mirror again and see if you're in fact shifted to one side. And again, we wanna be able to correct the shift first before we do anything else. Once the shift is corrected, stop the baseline, it's time to outline, figure out some test motions. Now, test motions I find are very important because it gives us another a couple of data points from a baseline standpoint, but some people like to just skip over this segment, but it is important for us to, again, establish the baseline to see what works and what doesn't. So forward bending, let yourself round forward to touch your toes. Try to minimize any extra strain in your back. And you can do this by putting your hands on your thighs and slowly sliding them down your legs to the point where you feel uh, the most comfortable, most limited, and you're going to slowly get back up. And you have to ask yourself, how do you feel? Better, worse, the same. The next step is that we have to do backwards bending. So you're going to put your hands on your butt and you're going to slowly lean backward while looking straight ahead and then slowly stand back up. How do you feel as a result of that? Do you feel better or is it the same? Are these symptoms starting to change a little bit? The next thing is we're going to focus on assessing side bending. We're going to go to the left first. You're going to place your left hand on your left thigh and slide it down as far down your left leg as possible. And again, how do you feel? Better, worse, or the same? Now it's time to side bend to the right, repeat as before, but now we're going to switch sides. So you're going to slide your right hand down your right side. And how do you feel? We need to assess rotation. So rotation to the right, you're going to turn your shoulders and look over the right shoulder. How do you feel? What are you experiencing? Rotation to the left, turn your shoulders and look over to the left side. Again, how do you feel? Better, worse, or the same? So here we have those forward and backwards, side to side and rotations, six movements. And you might have found a couple of movements were helpful, maybe remotely even made you feel just marginally better. Those movements are actually going to be your exercises for now. Now, if you couldn't find a spot of motion that actually improved your pain, don't lose hope. That means that we need to move down to the chain. So it's time to continue to listen outwards. What that means is that especially if you find a movement of your spine that is helpful, you might just find 
that only one or two of these positions were actually going to help your recovery. You don't need anything else for now, right? But this also means that the movements that actually made you worse or had no change to your pain, it's time for us to minimize, avoid, or modify those specific activities. So what that truly means, if say backbending feels great, then do stuff like cobras and backbends. I'm gonna give you a couple more examples later on in this episode. But if forward bending actually hurts, what that means is that you're going to want to avoid forward bending or rounding at your back for now. And you have to let what you feel be the guide on how you are going to improve your pain and how you are going to select your exercises. And so a couple of examples of exercises are going to be helpful for each spinal direction. Forward bending, aka spinal flexion, we're looking at a simple toe touch, child's pose, a single knee to chest, a double knee to chest the cat portion of the cat cow stretch. So again, usually with forward bending, you're probably gonna do well with this motion, but backwards bending might not feel the greatest. But if backwards bending felt pretty good, then you can do a simple back bend, just like the test motion. You can do a cobra press up. You can also do a cobra press up against the wall. You're probably gonna tolerate being more upright as compared to rounding. Now, when it comes to side bending, you're probably gonna enjoy if you enjoy side bending, you're going to be side bending to one specific side. So simply leaning to one side as if you're trying to put weight onto one leg. Uh, you can also reach up and over. And then you can also reach and lean into a door to really accentuate that stretch. You're either going to be opening up the painful side or closing down on the painful side. But the direction is going to be, again, dependent on how it makes you feel. Next, we have twisting. It's going to be a simple turn to the side or a spinal twist, moving your upper or lower body when laying on the floor. Again, just like any of these motions, there's going to be one specific direction that's probably going to make you feel better if your spine is the cause of the pain. Now, with these movements listed, again, there's only going to be a few minutes that are going to be feeling pretty good. And you'll most likely prefer one motion over the other. And it's usually the exact opposite direction that's going to be a little bit more irritating. So we're going to avoid that for now. So as promised, if you didn't find a spinal motion that actually improved your pain at rest, then it's actually time for us to move a little bit further down the chain. Your hips, specifically your glutes and your piriformis, of which your sciatic nerve does pass through, we need to be able to look at that. So if you have buttock pain, this can actually be a great assessment tool for you to treat your own pain on your own. So lay on your back, pull your knee up to your chest without moving your spine. This is called hip flexion. How do you feel as a result of that pain? Pull your knee up and across the opposite shoulder. How does that feel? Oh, also, if I may, do this for both legs. You don't have to do just one. See, in some cases, the opposite leg motion actually feels better. Why does that happen? I'm not 100% certain. Um, I find that uh, moving the opposite leg allows the core to engage. And in some cases, having the core engage um, allows you to stabilize your spine and, in essence, reduces the pain. So we have pulling up your knee to your chest. You have pulling your knee up and across to the opposite shoulder, but then we also have pull the knee outside your shoulder as well. So we have hip flexion with movement in either direction. Again, trying to find the position that actually allows you to get the most amount of relief. From there, I want to take a look at how crossing your leg over the other feels. So uh, while you're on your back, cross your right leg over your left with knees bent. This is going to be similar to the pigeon or figure four stretch. Pull your left knee up to your chest now. How does that feel? Lower and then press your right knee away from you. How does that feel? Now it's time to switch legs. You're going to cross your left, left leg over your right with your knees bent. Pull your right knee up to your chest. How does that feel? And then press your left knee away from you. How does that feel? And then now it's actually a time to assess what is called the windshield wiper position. You're going to put both feet flat on the floor so your knees are bent. and You're going to let the knees drip down to the right and then to the left. Do not let your back twist. See how is this hip motion? How does it feel? What happens when you change into the opposite direction? Again, which position is going to be bringing you the most relief? Once you find that out, do more of them, I would say, as often as possible as needed. And before we move on, I do have to clarify that when you are doing some of these stretches, they may feel, seem a little weird. They may seem different than what you're used to, but it does feel good because it feels good and reduces your pain. I like to say no stretch is too awkward. 
So we've been able to assess the quantity, the range of motion, and the quality of motion in both the low back and the hips. And you should have been able to find some sort of relieving position. And again, you have permission to do more of that. Anything that is painful or have no effect, you can absolutely get rid of and take it out of your day. But what if you don't really have pain at rest, but have pain with specific motions or positions? Does it make sense to give you strengthening exercises because your muscles are quote unquote weak? Unless we do a muscle test on you, we actually cannot tell if your muscles are weak. And that's the problem. If you are doing this on your own, it's hard to do your own muscle test. And if you're working with someone virtually, it's hard to do a muscle test as well. So it's going to be based on how you feel. So what we need to do is look at how you are doing your activities, how you are doing those things. And so an example, if you feel pain every time you bend over to pick something up from the floor, we need to look at how you're picking things up from the floor. It might be that you're arching too much or that you're rounding or you're, or something else. We need to be able to break down the activity that's painful to better understand how we can fix it. This also goes for positions like sitting. Look at how you sit or looking at how you sit actually tells you what can be causing your pain. It could be because of the positioning of sitting itself, or it can be how you're sitting. Question is, are you putting too much pressure on your butt or not enough? Are you in a weird twisted position? Again, all these questions, all the question answers to the, to these questions are going to be very, very useful in regards to treating your pain. So, which brings me up to the next part, which is going to be strengthening exercises. A lot of people say, Hey, do I need to get stronger? I think strength is going to be a great way for us to prevent the onset of pain and protect us, right? And so it is important for us to be strong and move, but exercises in motion should not be blindly prescribed. However, these are the most common core exercises that I often prescribe for my clients. And you're in luck because I'm actually going to be putting the link of these exercises in the show notes. The first exercise that I usually prescribe is going to be the Turkish getup, or at least the first stage. This actually helps you engage your upper and lower abs without creating too much sheer force or pressure on the spine. Somewhat similar to the McGill, uh, I think they call it like the crunch up, which allows you to engage your core. The second exercise is going to be the squat. We need to get those hips moving. A lot of squats are done incorrectly. So I want you to think about sitting with those hips back and down. And if you're allowed to let the, and, and, and you are allowed to let the torso lean forward, which means hinging at the hip. And speaking of hinging, we have the deadlift. I get that lifting things can hurt your back, but you cannot expect to never pick something up from the floor. And so might as well do it right. We're looking at engagement of the hamstrings for this specific motion. The fourth exercise is going to be the push-up. I want you to think about a plank and then some. We're engaging the abs, the shoulders, and the whole body. Number five, we're getting up and down from the floor. You're going to be surprised about how helpful this exercise can be. Now, there is going to be a lot of things to cover in sciatica pain management. The great news is that in this episode, it can actually help you manage a lot of problems. So you don't have to go through pain alone. Also, you don't have to follow a program blindly. And if you're going through a program blindly and aren't satisfied, speak up. Usually practitioners and programs don't know that you're not doing any better unless you tell them. Communication is key. And if you need help with your sciatica pain, feel free to book a free 30-minute call with me. Let's sit down and figure out a plan for you. The link to book a call is found in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you got some help from today's podcast. And for more info, check us out at ifixyoursciatica.com. Have a fantastic and pain-free day. No patient-therapist relationship is formed by listening to this podcast. We are not providing medical advice and all information should be confirmed by a medical provider.